Paul was a, a most remarkable man. Though Paul calls himself the least of the apostles, many Christians would call him the greatest of the apostles. He is the only apostle who did not, did not physically walk with Jesus. He might have seen Jer- Jesus in Jerusalem, but if he did, it was while Paul was an unbelieving Pharisee who hated Jesus. His salvation literally came out of nowhere while he was traveling to the city of Damascus to further persecute Christians. The the book of Acts tells us that Paul created havoc in the church in Jerusalem. He dragged people off to prison, and his persecution caused the Christians to flee Jerusalem to scatter around the Roman Empire. His hatred of Christianity was so great that he gained permission to pursue Christians to the city of Damascus. So with threats on his lips and murder in his heart, Saul of Tarsus made the long trek to Damascus to find and persecute the Christians there. On the way to Damascus, a bright light interrupted his journey. Saul fell on his face in the middle of the road. And there Jesus spoke with him and Saul was saved. His name was changed to Paul. And he was told that he would now go forth and minister. He would preach the gospel to kings and the nations. So several years later, Paul began preaching the gospel across the Roman Empire. Paul's ministry resulted in dozens, directly resulted in dozens of churches being planted. Thousands, probably tens of thousands of people were saved through his ministry. Paul wrote more books of the Bible than any other person. And God used Paul to clarify and expound the doctrines of salvation and of the church. Many people believe, myself included, that Paul was taken on a visit to heaven long before his death. From the Apostle Paul come some of the greatest single statements of biblical truth. For by grace are you saved through faith. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I could go on. Aside from Jesus... In my opinion, the Apostle Paul is the most significant figure in the church. Without the writings and ministry of Paul, the church would look extremely different than it does today. Paul also suffered greatly for the gospel and for the church. In 2 Corinthians 11, he summarized the troubles he faced. He was scourged five times. Beaten with staves three times. Stoned to death once, restored to life again. He was shipwrecked and spent a day and a night floating in the sea with the flotsam from one of those wrecks. He says that he was often cold, tired, and hungry for the sake of the church. He suffered greatly and he served faithfully. Paul was not a perfect Christian, but he probably stands out in in most Christians' minds as one of the best Christians to ever live. Despite all of Paul's incredible devotion, remarkable service, and terrible suffering, Paul was also uniquely chastened by God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul speaks of a thorn in the flesh he suffered. We do not know what that thorn was. Many people have asked, many people have offered a bunch of speculations, but the Bible just doesn't tell us what his thorn was. What the Bible does tell us is what Paul said about his thorn. He said it was a messenger of Satan given to buffet him. So the thorn in the flesh that Paul suffered was a a buffeting, a severe beating. Have you ever been in a fight when you had your nose broken, your eyes blackened? You ever get in a car wreck? Maybe you didn't have any serious injuries, but the next day you woke up and just were covered in bruises. That's the idea of the buffeting. It is that which just just beats you mercilessly. It doesn't necessarily break things, 
but it leaves you sore and bruised all over. This thorn was that something which inflicted incredible pain on the Apostle Paul. He said it was a messenger of Satan, which he asked God to take from him. The first thing he says, though, is that it was given to him. And this is important. As we keep thinking about this, this truth of chastening, the, the messenger of Satan was given to Paul, not by Satan, but by God. This was something that God gave to Paul. Satan was the tool that administered the pain, but it was God who sent this affliction. It was God who was in control of this whole thing so that when Paul cried out to God for deliverance, God said, no. God is the one that sent the, the pain. He's the one that can let the pain continue. He, he was acting sovereignly as the sovereign God of all circumstances. And he was doing so not maliciously. He was not inflicting pain on Paul just because he could. But rather, he allowed this pain to continue for Paul's spiritual benefit. So that God told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you through the affliction Paul was learning more deeply the sufficiency of the grace of God. Paul also says that he was given this thorn lest he be lifted up with pride. Because Paul had seen so many great things of God. He had revelations more than any other man. He had influence and ministry in the church more than any other apostle even. So that Paul would not be lifted up in pride, he was given this thorn in the flesh to humble him. It was a preventative from, for, from sin. Paul was not being punished for an open sin. He, he was not even punished for hidden sin. He was being prevented from moving into sin. And as we have considered in previous weeks, chastening is sometimes pain. Sometimes it is a thorn. Sometimes it is a whipping. Sometimes, though, chastening does not hurt. Chastening takes many different forms. Some of them are painful. Many are not. But one thing is true every time we are chastened. God always chastens us to teach us. Chastening is always instructive. God does chasten us to punish for sin in our lives. He does chasten us to prune us, to make us more fruitful. He does chasten us, as we see in Paul's life, to prevent us from falling into sin. But whether it is punishing, pruning, or preventing, chastening is always teaching. It's always to teach us something. And as I said last week, God is not waiting to smite us. He does not punish us as often as we deserve. And, and when I say Punish, I, I do not mean in that ultimate sense of punishing us in such a way that our, our guilt before him is taking away. This is not a saving punishment. I mean the punishment in the sense of bringing consequences on our sin that we may learn not to do it. Just like your children. You did not punish your children to make them your child. They were already your child. Because they were your child, you punished them to teach them, to bring them to maturity. The same way, it's exactly the same way with God in the chastening of us. It's nothing to do with saving us, but because we are saved and are His child, He chastens us to sanctify us, to cause us to grow in Christ. And in that sanctifying work, God does not spend most of His time inflicting painful punishment on us for our sin. Just consider your own children. How would they have responded if every time you corrected them, you spanked them? Every single time you had to get on them for anything, you also spanked them. That, that would be a, it'd be a cruel punishment. They would not learn of that. The, the majority of God's chastening on us is not that painful punishment. It's that perfecting, that instructing. He's not a vicious God bent on striking out at us for every wrong we do. He is a merciful and patient God who teaches us to purify us. The hardest thing for us to do when we are chastened, whether it be that mild chastening of the conviction of the Holy Spirit, 
or the severe chastening of a painful tragedy, whatever it is, is the hardest thing for us to do is to learn from that chastening. And when we fall under God's chastening, we have to, and this whole section here is teaching us to be careful, to not harden ourselves against it, to resist His, not ha- resist his chastening work. God is always teaching you something through the various ways He chastens you. The exhortation of Hebrews is to listen to the chastening that you may learn. So this portion of Hebrews 12 is teaching the Hebrew Christians how to profit from the persecution they were suffering. Remember, these believers were being afflicted because they were also Jews. And they had been, and to some extent, had also been keeping some of the ceremonies and the sacrifices of Judaism. And now they were being ostracized because they were also following Christ. And so that now they were being denied the temple. They were being pushed out of their families and their culture. They were being pushed out of the workplace by their family members, their neighbors, and their friends. And the author of Hebrews is exhorting them in their persecution. He's been exhorting them and will continue to exhort them to endure But now he's taking a step farther, not just to endure, but to profit from it. So that in Hebrews chapter 11, he has shown them the Old Testament saints who have endured. In the beginning of Hebrews chapter 12, he has shown them the enduring and perfect faith of Jesus. He then exhorts the the Jewish Christians to, uh, verse 3, consider Jesus, lest they uh, be weary and discouraged, lest they be fatigued and fainting. They are to, to focus their minds on, the, on Christ and the work that He has done for them. And then in verse 4, he, uh, excuse me, in, in verse 5, He rebukes them because they have forgotten an Old Testament exhortation that says, Do not despise the chastening of the Lord. So He moves from just endure to now profit. And these exhortations, therefore, our good too. This passage teaches us how to avoid despising God's chastening and how to profit from it. The the exhortation is very clear. Do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Look back in verse 2, where it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising... The shame. We are told that Jesus despised the shame of the cross. If you remember when we looked at that several weeks ago, he thought little of it. He disregarded it. That idea is the same one in verse 5. The Greek word is two different Greek words that are being used between verses 2 and verses 5, but they mean essentially the same thing. They are synonyms. Verse 5 has an emphasis, though, of, of taking it lightly of dismissing it, not paying attention to it. When you corrected your children, how many times did you tell them, look at me? I mean, I remember that with all our kids. Look at me. Look me in the eyes while I'm talking. Well, we did that you, because we know we have to have their, ta- their attention if they are going to learn from us. Even when dealing with adults, we sometimes see this. We may explain something to somebody and we see that they're not paying any attention. They are completely tuned out. And you may, you may be thinking, I'm going to have to tell them this again. You may do something to get their attention, but you know that if they're not paying attention, they're not learning. And God is chastening to teach us. Therefore, we must pay attention so that we will learn what he's teaching. Don't dismiss it. Don't belittle it. But attend to it. The author, Arthur Pink, he warns of four ways that we can despise the chastening of the Lord. First, by callousness. That is a, a false stoicism that hardens the heart against the chastening. Second, by complaining. A, a peevish self-justification that acts as if the chastening is unwarranted. Third, by criticism, denying the goodness, purpose, and wisdom of God in His chastening. And fourth, by carelessness, simply not seeking to learn what God is teaching. What I want to do this morning is give you a few practical points from this section of Hebrews to help us profit from chastening. 
First and foremost, remember God is always the perfect and loving Heavenly Father. How many times does it say it in this passage? Verse 6, whom the Lord loves, He chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Verse 7, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. Verse 8, he says, if you're without chastening, you are illegitimate and not sons. Verses 9 and 10, he compares it to the chastening of our earthly fathers who chasten their children. We have to remember that God is the loving Heavenly Father. He chastens us because we are His children. And, and for most of us, I think except in cases of abuse, chastening probably did not cause us to seriously doubt the love of our earthly fathers. I know we didn't enjoy it. We may have been mad. We may have stomped off complaining for a little bit. But there's still that knowledge and that understanding they loved us. Much more so, we must never forget that God's chastening is no less loving than the chastening of your parents. God's chastening is infinitely more loving than the chastening of the most loving earthly parent. So when you go through the times of chastening, walk through them with the firm conviction that God loves you. That you are His child and He is chastening because He loves you. The second is to be quick to submit yourself to the Father. Verse 9, he says, Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of Spirits, to God? Submit yourself quickly to the chastening of God. Submission is, is simply placing yourself under another. It's, it's a military term that has the idea of, of being in the proper space in line. And the military really is a great example of what this looks like because every branch of the, of the military has a rigid system of ranks so that a corporal always outranks a private. A captain is always outranked by a colonel. And a private first class is always duty-bound to, to obey the orders of a master sergeant unless he's received other orders from a higher authority to the contrary. So submission is simply following the directions of our ranking officer. It's submitting my will to the will of another. This is a part of life. We, we know this. If you work anywhere, at some place, at some point, you're going to have to submit your will to the will of another. As American citizens, we all submit our will to the will of the government. I'm sure none of us really wants to give our state and federal governments thousands of dollars every single year. But we submit our will, and we file our taxes. And we pay them. That's what it's talking about. When it comes to chastening, we are to put ourselves under the will of God. I don't want to be chastened. And I can tell you that just categorically. I don't want it. I don't like it. But when it comes to the chastening, I'm not to oppose it. I'm not to resist it. We are not to rebel against it. We are to submit ourselves under it. We are to allow God to chasten us and allow Him to teach us through chastening. Did, when, when your kids were home, did any of your kids ever run away when you tried to give them a spanking? Or did they tell you, stop lecturing me, I don't want to hear it? Did they resist the, the instruction or the punishment? Don't do that. I mean, really, that, it's that simple. Don't do that. When God chastens, to, chastens you, submit to it so you can learn from it. And then last, and this is going to be the longest point, so don't think you're getting out early. Um, last, God always chastening us, chastens us for our profit. He perfectly chastens us for our profit. Our fathers, parents, never perfectly chastened us. I never perfectly chastened my kids. I'm willing to bet that you never perfectly chastened yours. At some point, we responded out of anger or frustration instead of love. At some point, you, you chastened. Maybe you yelled at them just so they would leave you alone for a few minutes. Or maybe you punished them because what they did really embarrassed you. Whatever it was, it was not always righteous chastening. 
God never chastens out of frustration. He never chastens because we're getting on his nerves. He always chastens for a profit. Always. And it tells us here in this passage that the profit of God's chastening is threefold. It's holiness, it's righteousness, and it's peace. So God chastens us every single time to produce in us holiness, to produce in us righteousness, to produce in us peace. This chastening for holiness is an incredible, rich blessing. God chastens us so that he tells us specifically, verse 10, that we may be partakers of his holiness, that we can profit by having a part of his holiness in our life today. This holiness is essential to a relationship with God. A few verses uh, down the page in verse 14, it says that without holiness, no one will see God. You must be holy to enter heaven. God gives you holiness at the moment of your salvation so that when you trust Christ as your Savior, He makes you His holy child. He takes away your sin and and declares that you are now righteous before Him so that you are, in in the eyes of God, are holy. And then God begins to work in your life to produce more holiness in you. So that because you are holy in Christ, you must be holy in this life. And God in His grace works to bring forth that holiness which must be present. So what do you think of when I say holiness? Do you think of rules about smoking or drinking, going to movies or owning a TV? Do you think of a legalistic church that maybe you once attended? Do you think holiness is not doing the fun things in life? Most people do not think fondly of holiness. Most people tend to view it as a great restriction on our lives. So that we, we define holiness in the terms of the negative, what it is not. You don't do this or that or the other. I, I want to describe holiness for you this morning in terms of what it is. I, I want to give you briefly a glimpse of the good thing that holiness is and why we should, should desire it. And I'm indebted to the Puritan pastor, Stephen Charnock, for these, these positive descriptions of holiness. He has an incredible section uh, in, in some of his writings talking about this. But holiness is the presence of perfect love, of love that gives itself freely without thought of reward. Holiness is hatred of sin. Holiness is integrity And honesty, it is the character that can be relied upon to keep his word. Holiness is patience that endures the wrongs and slights and irritations of others with kindness and compassion. Holiness is gentleness that responds appropriately to others in all situations. Holiness does everything possible to maintain a right relationship with others. Holiness strives to do what God has said. It it strives to walk in obedience to his commands. Holiness for the Christian is the lifting up of God's glory. It is praising him for all his goodness, thanking him for all things, and trusting him at all times. So that holiness is the presence in the Christian's life of the perfections of God. So that holiness is us living in a way that looks like God. That means you consider the glory, the goodness, the joy of God. That means that what should be flowing out of our life is not this walking around feeling like I'm under a terrible burden because I can't do anything. But rather we, we have this joy because of the bountiful blessing from God to be like Him. Because holiness is the chief attribute of God. Holiness is the one thing that separates him most from all of his creation. The holiness of God is the primary subject of the angels' praise of him in heaven. So that in the days of Isaiah the prophet, we we see that the angels in the throne room of God were crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. 
In the days still to come, the book of Revelation tells us that when God begins to pour out His judgments on the world, the angels in the throne room of heaven will still be crying out, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. So by growing in holiness, we grow in that which is the supreme characteristic of our God. God chastens us to make us more like Himself to increase in us the glory that is His, that we may enjoy the unfettered blessings by being like Him. So instead of viewing holiness like Eve viewed the fruit in the Garden of Eden, focusing on that one thing it could not have, let us consider the many blessings of holiness Let us see that the garden of holiness is a pleasant place to live and is full of good things for us. Let us seek after holiness. And because God loves us, He desires us to have that good fruit of holiness. He chastens you that you might have that rich profit of being holy. We're also told that God chastens you to produce fruit in you. We've considered this generally in previous weeks. John 15 teaches that that the Father prunes the fruitful branch to make it more fruitful. Now in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11, we are told the specific fruit that God is working to produce in us. It says, No chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. The chastening of God is intended to produce in us fruit, the fruit of righteousness. And to bring it very narrow, righteousness is the state of being as you were designed to be. So that righteousness is the rightness of a person or a matter. So that righteousness in the heart is being in a right relationship with God, no longer separated from Him, but now reconciled to Him by Jesus. Righteousness in the life is living in the right way according to the law of God. So that righteousness in the life is living in the way that is pleasing to God, that is doing what He has instructed. Now, now righteousness is more than doing a list of things. I know that in the past, and in certain churches, righteousness was, was presented as, as keeping the right rules so that if you did not listen to rock and roll and you did go soul winning, you might be righteous. We still have churches like that around today. We also have a, a whole other set of churches that say righteousness is what you do and don't do. So that in some of these churches, they actually say righteousness is not having a set of rules to follow or fighting for social justice. Now it is true that righteousness absolutely is reflected in what you do. But righteousness is not primarily about what you do. Righteousness is about who you are, what you are within. Righteousness starts in the heart. And so God chastens us to produce within us that internal righteousness that is essential for a genuine life of righteousness. God's chastening, therefore, is not just about teaching you the surface things. Now, it may be when, when God chastens you, He may be teaching you to hold your temper or to stop listening to certain things. God also, and I would say He is probably teaching you to have a righteous heart. He's not just teaching you so you count to ten before you say something. He is teaching you so that you have a heart of peace and patience and kindness. He is working to produce within that love, that joy, the faithfulness, the gentleness, the self-control, those fruits of the Spirit that are first within before they ever become evident in our life. And God is working through chastening to produce fruit, the fruit of righteousness. And it tells us that the fruit of righteousness is peaceful. It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Hebrews is telling us peace is possible. After much discussion about this turmoil of chastening, 
It's comforting to know that our, our life is not going to be an unbroken string of trials. If you heed the chastening of God, there comes a calm in the storm. And these Jewish Christians are going through intense trials. They were on the verge of even greater troubles. They must have found great consolation in these words. And I think this absolutely is referring to, to a peace in circumstances, at least times of peace. But it's more than those peaceful interludes. The fruit of righteousness brings with it peace. This is that peace within the heart that comes from a perfect peace with God. Isaiah 26 verse 3 promises you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. We sang that. Stayed upon Jehovah. Hearts are fully blessed. Finding as he promised perfect peace and rest. Philippians 4 speaks of the peace of God that passes understanding. This is the peace that comes with righteousness. Peace that will keep us and guard our hearts and our minds. It's a peace that that cannot be understood. I mean, how can I explain to you something that's beyond our comprehension? I'd have better luck describing the mechanism which causes gravity to work than describing to you this peace that passes all understanding. I can tell you if you've had it or have it, you know it. You know exactly what it is. And this peace that God gives is more real and more lasting even than gravity. The universe that we are currently in will be destroyed, replaced by a new heaven and a new earth. The peace of God will survive this universe and remain forever because peace is found in the person of God. Scriptures repeatedly tells us He is the God of peace. And He gives peace peace to those who trust him to those who with prayer and thanksgiving cry out to him making their request known this peace of God is a peace within a calmness of soul that triumphs over the troubles of our circumstances this is a tranquility that can remain unruffled despite the most severe tribulation so that the fruit of righteousness is a peaceful and a peace-bringing fruit. In the year 1415, John Huss was burned at the stake for preaching against the Pope, against the selling of indulgences, and preaching for the authority of the Bible. The wood was piled up around him all the way up to his neck. The fire is lit, and history tells us that while the flames sprang up all around him, he was heard to cheerfully sing a hymn. How is that possible? John Huss is just one example of many Christians who went to martyrdom with a song on their lips or praise to God in their mouth. Do you, do you remember what happened to Paul and Silas in the city of Philippi? They were arrested. They were beaten severely with sticks. After the beating, they were thrown immediately into the local jail. That night, as their injuries are now throbbing and aching, the two men prayed and sang hymns to God. How how could they do that? How can anyone go to a stake, a cross, a prison, or the chopping block with peace? How can they go singing And rejoicing. Because the chastening of God produces righteousness. Which is a peaceful, peace-bringing fruit. And God gives peace to His children that will absolutely sustain them in all circumstances. So this morning as I'm thinking about this, I, I don't mean you need to start striving now so that maybe one day if you're arrested for being a Christian, you can sing a hymn. Right now, walk with God, trust Him that you might have peace this afternoon when you go to work tomorrow, when you deal with the family conflict or when you go to the hospital to visit a loved one. Whatever the circumstance may be that you have peace because you are walking with God and you are being trained by His chastening. If you will do that, You will have righteousness. You will have peace that passes understanding. One one final exhortation. Do not faint 
when you're chastened. We go back, and he tells us in verse 3, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. It's the same word. It's um, used later, verse 5, says, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. Instructions, consider Jesus, lest you be weary and discouraged. Do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor faint. That's really, literally what it is. It's the, uh, the, the word has the idea of the loosening of the limbs, the unmanning of someone so that they cannot go any farther. Speaks of exhaustion so great that it brings a person to the point of collapse, of quitting. When a soldier joins the U.S. Marines, he goes to boot camp. And he immediately, before he even gets off the bus, begins to suffer through a series of events intended to push him to the point of physical, mental, and emotional exhaustion. This is not so much to break the new recruit as it is to teach him how to endure the most intense opposition that a human will ever face. At the end of the Marines boot camp, they have something they call the crucible. It's a three-day march with little food and even less sleep. Over the course of those three days, they hike 60 miles, carrying 70 pounds of gear, while also making multiple stops to run through various obstacle courses. Finally, they make a grueling hike up, the, up a mountain. How is it possible for someone to do this while also performing precise combat drills along the way? It is through intense training that these men learn how to endure something that three months before, not a one of them could have handled. It is through that process of training that they learn. And I know that sometimes the chastening of the Lord is so intense that we may feel like a drill sergeant screaming at her in our face at three in the morning would be a relief. But God is always chastening us for our benefit. So that we consider Jesus. Consider our Father. We consider what His Son endured. We think deeply on the work that He has done for us and for our salvation. We endure now and trust Him now in whatever trials we are facing that we may profit from them. That we may bear that peaceable fruit of righteousness. That we may be made partakers of His holiness. So that we are trained by chastenings for our eternal profit. Psalm 56 verse 9 says, This I know, for God is for me. Four words I want you to remember from this entire study on chastening. For God is for you. God is for you. All he does is for your profit. Everything he does is for your good. Because God is for you. Father, we do thank you. Thank you that we have the assurance that you are working for our benefit, our gain in all things. You're working and dealing with us not as an enemy, not as an angry judge, but as a loving Father. And that Father, as your children, that we do not enjoy the times of chastening and we do not seek them out. Yet, Lord, when we go through them, we can know your goodness. We can know your love. We can be reminded of your gracious working. So, Lord, I pray that you will teach us to profit. That we will view our tribulations as for our good. That we may seek to learn the good that is in them. Lord, we pray for your blessings, your continued grace and teaching in us in the rest of our day together and in our week ahead. We ask all this in your holy name. Amen.